After spending weeks stranded abroad, 190 Bahamans are back home. A young father from Africa feeling the pressures to provide for his family, plus a huge donation of bread. News is brought to you by Alive. Welcome to Our News and thank you for joining us. I'm Kyle Joaquin. After spending weeks stranded abroad, 190 Bahamians are back home tonight. It's the first phase of the government's repatriation exercise. Though relatives were not able to collect them from Lyndon Pinning International Airport after their Bahamas Air flight touched down, those Bahamians were whisked away to, government, to a government facility where they were checked by health officials. It's back on home soil for 190 Bahamans, the first group in the phased approach of returning these citizens who were locked out after borders closed in March. From the plane, residents were asked to stow away their phones and cameras. Immigration officials took passports from passengers while they were still on the plane. Once all the passengers were cleared, they were allowed to deplane and collect their luggage from the tarmac. The first round of Bahamians were transported via five majestic tour buses from Linden Pinling International Airport just after 11 this morning. They were taken to Breeds' Hotel along Cable Beach, where Ministry of Health officials were waiting behind gates guarded by heavily armed Defense Force officers. Suitcases, bins, and baby strollers were offloaded as the recently returned Bahamians were taken off the shuttles and through a door where they were checked by health officials. Ministry of Foreign Affairs Director General Sharon Brennan Haylock explained how they determine who gets to quarantine at home or remain at the government's quarantine facility. They will all go to the quarantine facility. Um, health will do an interview process there and some other processing um, uh, done by health criteria to determine who will go home and self-isolate and who will remain in the quarantine facility. Only one or two relatives were there eager to see their loved ones as they were encouraged not to. The passengers all tested negative for COVID-19 in Florida. But it's been a tough few weeks for many of these Bahamans who pleaded with government to allow them to come home. And while 190 were scheduled to be brought back home today, hundreds more are waiting overseas. Brennan Haylock says there is a plan to bring them home as well. We are now putting together a plan for a phased approach for Bahamian nationals who uh, have been displaced and are in various jurisdictions around the world, and we're putting together a plan to bring them home. The long-anticipated arrival comes amid controversy that heightened in the last week over the landing of permanent residents on a private aircraft, where a group of six disembarked, which eventually led to the resignation of Dr. Dwayne Sands as Minister of Health. The Prime Minister called it a breach of protocol. A young Abaconian father-to-be says he's feeling the pressure to provide for his growing family as they pick up the pieces left behind by Hurricane Dorian. Jared Higgs has his story. 21-year-old Dante Zilma's life changed dramatically eight months ago when Hurricane Dorian tore through Abaco. I took my parents and my grandparents out of jobs. They had destroyed their homes. Zilma is trying to get his life back on track. He has a baby on the way and wants to be able to do more for his family. However, he says the process is slow. It makes me aggravated because at the end of the day, I feel like I is the one who get a supply and help for my family. So if I can't do that, I don't feel, I don't feel right. I don't feel like a man. So at the end of the day, I still go there and see what I could do or if I could find something to do. But, but it, usually the process is slow. Zilma spoke to us from his Central Pines Abaco home. Like so many homes in Abaco, it sustained major damage during the monster storm. All the ceilings and stuff we took down because of mold and mildew. We still ain't get everything sorted out, clean up because the roof's still leaking. There's a big hole up there where the top is over. That's bad news, says Zilma, who gives us a tour of the home where he and five other family members stay. This is my bedroom where I stay. And I have a tent right there so when it rains or when it get cold, and also the houses, it isn't closed properly so a lot of mosquitoes be inside, bike new, so I have this tent so I could sleep in peace sometimes. But my rest of my family, them, my brothers and my 
My other cousins who were with me, they can't. They really have hell. The pandemic has served Abaconians with a double blow as demand for government aid has skyrocketed. Many Abaconians have slammed government's response to the storm, and Zilma is among them. You have some local government people who stepping in, who doing what they supposed to do, but little or not, they don't. They still don't have enough support from the from the big party that's supposed to be helping them. Besides Hurricane Dorian and the pandemic, Zilma's family had to cope with the passing of his grandfather about four months after the monster storm. John Jack Hardy was a noted columnist and teacher. He writes for the Tribune. Zilma was hurt by his grandfather's passing but says he is motivated to become a provider for his family. With his home island destroyed and family life changing, Zilma says the pressure is on. It ain't easy as in saying we have to get food every day, we have to get gas for the store, we have to get gas for the, for the generator. Reporting for Our News, I'm Jared Higgs. Progressive Liberal Party Deputy Leader Chester Cooper is calling on government to outline for taxpayers a comprehensive plan in response to the economic fallout from the coronavirus. This after the finance minister revealed government may borrow $250 million following the pandemic. Berthony McDermott reports. The revelation by Finance Minister Peter Turnquist that government will likely borrow at least $250 million in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic comes as no surprise to opposition deputy leader Chester Cooper, who says taxpayers deserve a detailed account of how that money will be spent. What we would like to see, though, is more transparency in relation to uh, where funding is coming from, what it's going to be used for, and ideally we'd like to see that in advance. Not Acknowledging that these are difficult times, Cooper said there should be more economic briefings. He said it is his belief that fear over the economic fallout now outweighs fear of the coronavirus. Cooper says government has few options available to assist in jump-starting the economy and a tax increase should not be one of them. The tool of borrowing is available to the government. Uh, I'm certain that they will have taken the tool. I am concerned. That the cost of borrowing has increased as a result of the downgrades. Uh, Standard and Poor's recently indicated that uh, foreshadowed a downgrade. This is going to increase the cost of borrowing. Uh, the worse the downgrade is, uh, the more pronounced the junk status is, the higher the cost of borrowing in the U.S. market is going to be. On Wednesday, Turnquest reiterated that government has no intentions of raising taxes after the pandemic. Back in January, Turnquest announced government's intention to borrow $600 million post-Dorian. Earlier this week, Central Bank Governor John Rule estimated the Bahamian economy would not recover from the economic crisis caused by COVID-19 until 2022. I know that there's been an, appoint an appointment of a what they call an economic recovery committee. In fact, there's been appointments uh, of several committees. Uh, what we need to see, though, hopefully sooner rather than later, is a comprehensive economic plan. Uh, much like the emergency COVID plan that I released on, on April 10th. Reporting for Our News, I'm Berthony McDermott. Healthcare workers make up 23% of those infected by COVID-19. It's a statistic revealed by a senior health official. Georgia Bain reports. The Ministry of Health remains concerned about the number of frontline health care workers who have contracted the COVID-19 virus. This according to health consultant Dr. Mercelin Del Regis, who revealed during Thursday's health presser that the count now stands at 22. We've recorded 22 health care workers, five physicians, one physiotherapist, two trained clinical nurses, one domestic staff, seven registered nurses, six patient care assistants and technicians. If you would show the next slide, we looked at this. This accounts for 23.9% of the total cases in the Bahamas. As a result of the shortage of health care workers, student nurses undergoing training at public health care facilities are now being considered registered nurses as a result of the amended emergency order. However, down the street at Doctors Hospital, CEO Charles Seeley said the private hospital has not been affected by a shortage. One of the things we did very early is we started to do some mitigation exercises and one was to reduce one, our outpatient activity. 
Secondarily, we went and looked at our inpatient activity and really ensured that we only admitted those who absolutely had to. What that did for us then, of course, is we were able to leverage our resources. And so we've not been impacted significantly by the fact that some healthcare workers have been exposed and have been placed on self-isolation or quarantine. So we've been able to manage the care both for the patients who are coming at the Doctors Hospital Collins Avenue, as well as those who are being treated at Doctors Hospital West Sumble Lake Road. According to Sealy, depending on how many coronavirus patients are being treated at its Blake Road facility, Doctors Hospital can have about 40 persons on staff. He said a vital part has been obtaining the necessary protective equipment for the staff members. Similarly, again, another collaborative effort. Um, I must thank the, the Minister of Health uh, and the team there. They've been very, very helpful in supporting what we have. Uh, it has been a challenge on the onset to be able to acquire, but we are at a good place right now. We continue to bring in more supplies and wherever support and aid is needed, we're able to leverage that by requesting from the government and they've willingly uh, come alongside. Despite a shortage in testing equipment, Seely said he is grateful for the hospital's partnership with the Ministry of Health, which has prevented the hospital from experiencing any level of shortage in equipment. Reporting for our news, I'm Giorgio Bain. All right, thanks, Giorgio. Still to come, a local farmer gets creative during the COVID-19 crisis. Plus, meet the often overlooked but important part of the team at PMH. Stay tuned. News and thanks for joining us. Topping news tonight. COVID 19 remains a serious threat. Coronavirus COVID 19 has disrupted our economy, tourism industry, educational system, and put our healthcare facilities and professionals on high alert. Are you prepared? Do you have all the facts? Stay tuned to this network for the very latest news and information on this global pandemic. A farmer is taking an innovative approach to growing crops. Jared Hayes has more. From the outside, it looks like an old shipping container with a door. But when you step inside, it is clear that this is not your average farm. This is one of a kind. You'll never see one like this anywhere else in the world. Sarone Dean is the brain behind Organic Solar, an operation that specializes in growing microgreens. His indoor lab just needs a bed and you could sleep like a baby. It's temperature controlled. Uh, the lighting system is pretty much the best money you can buy. The microgreens Dean grows are highly sought after for their high nutritional value. They are also used as a flavor and visual enhancer, especially in upscale restaurants. While many traditional farmers see an increase in interest for their products, Dean says he has seen a drop off in clients. Pretty much all of the businesses uh, that we do business with as far as restaurants and hotel restaurants, you know, they've closed. Thankfully, Dean says an upmarket food store extended a lifeline. Still, he, like other farmers, says growth prospects are narrow. Agriculture in this country is a very, it's very discouraging for anyone who, who, who figures they have the next great idea. If you speak to anyone in agriculture, one of the main issues we have every day is funding. Uh, if I go to the to any government agency and ask for a loan to build something like this, they'll tell me no. Concerns over food security have grown since the start of the pandemic, but the innovative farmer thinks the conversation is long overdue. Tourism being the number one industry in the Bahamas, well, agriculture should have been that. While he admits that agricultural work is discouraging, the indoor farmer says he is driven by passion. His message for other farmers out there. So let's get to work. Let's. Let's not only work on what we do, let's work together. Uh, let's do some things that are different. And let's show everyone that we can not only grow for ourselves, but we can grow for everyone in the Bahamas. Reporting for our news, I'm Jared Higgs. They may not tend to patients, but they're a critical part of the team at Princess Margaret Hospital. Tonight, Jerome Sawyer highlights the hospital's janitorial staff. This story was brought to you by Sun Oil Limited, fueling growth for people. They are often overlooked, even forgotten. But without them, the Princess Margaret Hospital and most other places couldn't function at the level it does. They are the janitorial staff. Ernestine Bodie is the acting supervisor of housekeeping for the medical block. 
She and her team of housemen and housekeepers ensure the facility is clean and properly sanitized around the clock. We are frontline staff. We definitely is the ones that cleans up behind everybody else that made their mess. Mm -hmm. After the nurses and the doctors already finished dealing with their patients and also um, the auxiliaries on the floor, anything that they use is to go goes in the bin or what's drop on the floor, we are responsible for. And Bodhi and her team are determined to keep it all together. She sees everyone as playing an important role in the hospital, as they are all in the life-saving business. And like many of her fellow healthcare workers, at times she feels the risks associated with being a frontline worker. This is my profession. This is my profession that I have chosen, so I must demonstrate quality care and be professional in whatsoever I do. But yes, there is a fear that when we go home, we have a family that is very concerned about us and what may be walking through our home doors. Bonded as well by the fact that people still aren't staying at home. If you stay at home, then you wouldn't be transmitting and you wouldn't be coming in contact and putting your very own family lives at risk. Reporting for our news, I'm Jerome Sawyer. All right, thanks, Jerome. Still to come, Sunshine Finance steps up to help feed the hungry. Stay tuned. News and thanks for joining us. Topping news tonight. COVID 19 remains a serious threat. Coronavirus COVID 19 has disrupted our economy, tourism industry, educational system, and put our healthcare facilities and professionals on high alert. Are you prepared? Do you have all the facts? Stay tuned to this network for the very latest news and information on this global pandemic. Watching our news, welcome back. The continued help of corporate Bahamas has assisted greatly in the fight against hunger. According to Bahamas Feeding Network Executive Director Philip Smith, their organization could not have helped thousands in need without generous donations. Jillian Gray has more. After giving away thousands of bags of grocery last week, Executive Director of the Bahamas Feeding Network Philip Smith said they are not slowing in their fight against hunger as people need help now more than ever. It's just amazing the demand, you know, it's just peaked like you would not believe. And we'll probably do three, 500 bags today, okay? But over the last, just in the last week, we have given out about 2,000 in the last week. Today, we'll do at least I would say three to five hundred bags today. Since the blow of the pandemic, the Bahamas Feeding Network has given away over two hundred thousand dollars worth of food parcels. Smith said that would not have been possible if not for the generosity of the private sector. He expressed his gratitude to Sunshine Finance, which donated one thousand one hundred loaves of bread to add to their care packages. Operations manager at Sunshine Finance, Darnetta Turnquest, said it is a privilege to serve the community. During this time of COVID-19, we especially understand the hard suffering that, you know, uh, people are experiencing due to uh, being out of work or simply even uh, persons before this, you know, were, were seeing some hard times. So it is crucial that we who can help step up and lend a helping hand. Sunshine Holdings plans to further its reach by feeding essential workers and reaching out to other civic organizations. With eight in her household, Melanie Sands said the food will go a long way. Both she and Bridget Knowles have been out of work and they were grateful for the generous grocery package. On behalf of my family, I am very grateful and happy, you know, that he is assisting, you know, in this time of our crisis. I was here from six this morning. Everything was successful and I got my package, rice and fruits was good. Reporting for our news, I'm Jillian Gray. Right, thanks Jillian. Still to come, members of the sporting community getting some much needed assistance. Stay tuned.
News and thanks for joining us. Topping News tonight. COVID-19 remains a serious threat. Coronavirus COVID-19 has disrupted our economy, tourism industry, educational system, and put our healthcare facilities and professionals on high alert. Are you prepared? Do you have all the facts? Stay tuned to this network for the very latest news and information on this global pandemic. And finally tonight, a local sporting association extending a helping hand to its members. Marcellus Hall reports. The quarantine imposed by COVID-19 has continued to infect local leagues around town. One of those leagues, the New Province Basketball Association, deciding to reach out to its members during these times. Executive of the New Providence Basketball Association extending a helping hand to its members on Thursday. The association handing out bags of groceries to the league's players. League spokesman Moses Johnson talked about the initiative. We know at this time it's rough. I know with the COVID-19 um, pandemic going on, people are losing their jobs, you know, people not working. Uh, some people and, and our players and coaches come from a, a large range and demographics. So we, we just want to go out there and help, help in any small way we can and um, give back a little bit of, of what they give to us because they make, the, they make the season and they make the league what it is. So it has brought everybody together, you know, uh, you say hard times make make tough people, so we, we've bonded together and it, it's brought everybody together. And I hope that this effort and this community effort is something that can bring the teams together and that, that can show that uh, from the executive standpoint that we stand with them and uh, we're in this fight together. Johnson adding that the executives are prepared to make adjustments if needed when the all clear is called to resume activities. I think things should run smoothly. I think once the go-ahead is given, we'll be able to get back into the, into the swing of things. There may be a few tweaks or adjustments made to, to, to the schedule and length of games, but we'll see how it goes. Once everything is all, all cleared and given, uh, we'll, we'll definitely let everybody know what's going on. Now, as far as the playoffs and championships, which were interrupted by the quarantine, Johnson says they're hopeful to be able to continue there as well. Uh, discussions are still ongoing, but um, we, we look forward to the president's um, idea and Team Next Level's ideas to continue with the playoffs and continue the finish of the season. So now as league officials hope to have things returned to normal sooner rather than later, well, the waiting process does continue. For our news, I'm Marcellus Hall. The weather is next. Thank you for joining us for Our News tonight. On behalf of the entire team, I'm Kyle Joaquin. Remember, you can catch Our News on the Go with the Go Play app. Have a good Friday evening, Bahamas.